The condition of the discontinuities in a rock mass is the largest component, individual component of the rock mass rating system. It's scored from 0 to 30, which is larger than any of the other components in the original system. So it's really important. Remember, rock mass rating gives an overall score of 0 through 100. So 30% of that total score comes from how are the discontinuities? Are they good? Are they bad? I don't know. So it's good to have a way to break down exactly what goes into that, into that system. And there's five different components. Each of these are scored from 0 to 6, right? So 5 by 6 gets you a score of, again, at most 30 and at least 0 if you have 0 by 6 or 0 by 5, excuse me. But the first of these is going to be persistence of your discontinuities. So persistence is kind of a fun word, right? We like to persist in our endeavors, whatever they may be. Maybe it's learning about rock mechanics from a series of YouTube videos, I don't know. But persistence is basically length. What is the length of our discontinuities, right? And that can be a little bit difficult to determine sometimes, right? Especially if you're in an underground excavation. If you're in a tunnel or something, a lot of times, you know, even if you can very clearly see a discontinuity, a joint set, a fault, a fracture, whatever, you can see it running around. Maybe it's cut off at some point by, you know, the extents of the tunnel. And then, well, what's the exact length? We don't know. So sometimes you can get the exact length of things if they're small enough. Sometimes it's not a matter of how big or how small. And is it just big enough to be stable for our excavation? Or is it too small to be a concern, right? And un again, unless you're coming in with, you know, expensive geophysical or scanning equipment to map out these discontinuities exactly, you're not going to have a perfect estimate of this thing. But, of course, the big thing here is, of course, shorter discontinuities or less persistent discontinuities are good. We like less persistence, right? Less is, oops, I started drawing a little frowny face there accidentally. Less is good. There we go. Less persistence is a good thing, right? And don't let this confuse you, right? Because discontinuity spacing is different, right? And sometimes the gut reaction with less persistent is to think of a lot of small little discontinuities, you know, which of course are going to be very bad. You don't want those just because, you know, if they're spaced really close together, that's going to compromise your rock mass a lot. But no, remember, persistence exists on its own as its own variable, right? Right. And when we have less persistence independent of the discontinuity spacing, that's a good thing, right? Because think of it this way. Would you rather have a bunch of small discontinuity space super close together or a bunch of giant ones, right, that are spaced close together and are going to persist throughout the rock mass and give you trouble for, you know, several hundreds of feet or meters or whatever to come, right? The answer, of course, will generally be you want the, the small one shorter discontinuities right so the second piece that we look at here is the aperture which is a fun word aperture persistence a lot of fun words here aperture which refers to the space uh, within the discontinuity the space between the surfaces would be the best way of putting it. space between surfaces so if we just draw our little pictures here, right, when you think about a discontinuity, really all it is, is is a plane, a break between the rock, right? So you could have them like this, and maybe this space is, you know, just a single millimeter, or you could have them like this, and maybe this space is a full three millimeters, right? And hopefully this is pretty intuitive, but generally speaking, less aperture, again, less space between your discontinuities is going to be good we want there to be a smaller space right because that's that gives their that gives a greater surface area over which friction can act right if all of a sudden your your planes are being spaced further and further apart or your surface is rather then there's going to be much less ability for friction to act between them which is going to reduce the amount of shear stress that's able to resist and thus reduce the shear strength increase the vulnerability to failure by shear of the rock mass and of course, failure by shear in something like a, like a tunnel like this is going to be a huge liability for blocks starting to fall out, you know, wedges falling out of, out of the back here. And, you know, that's a safety hazard. If you've got workers down there, if you've got expensive equipment, uh, just for the stability of the excavation in general, right? So failure by shear, bad. And having less, uh, less aperture is going to be uh, conducive to uh, 
a higher shear strength of or less uh, making the rock mass less prone to failure by shear right and so of course aperture as far as measuring it goes you can come in uh, you can use some common tools right for for much more narrow apertures you know we're talking less than a single millimeter you might have something like pencil lead uh, your fingernail a knife edge things like this to kind of estimate just how just how wedged together it is for bigger things of course once you get on the scale of you know millimeters and above you know you can bring out a ruler that has millimeters marked on it right and you can more easily measure it generally speaking once you start getting above a single millimeter you're talking pretty bad in terms of as far as aperture goes right anything below a single millimeter at least by the system I'm looking at is going to be a four five or a six which remember for each of these uh, six is going to be the, the highest rating you can get which is going to be pretty good the third thing that we look for here is the roughness of the discontinuities and this one is a little less quantitative it's actually a lot less quantitative I should say the roughness of the joints right these two ultimately we can quantitatively measure them right the the persistence appears to be about oh, about uh, three meters the aperture uh, it's about a millimeter this one with the roughness I don't know you could try to come up with some oh it's roughly sinusoidal with a whatever an amplitude of so many millimeters but you know we're not really we're not really into that it's more trouble than it's worth right so Really, it comes down to these kind of vague delineations that the original system makes. Is it very rough? Is it rough? Is it slightly rough? Is it smooth? Is it slick and sided? And generally speaking, of course, rougher is going to be good for us. And again, that comes down to our friend friction. Are you seeing a trend here? Friction's going to be a good thing, right? As far as a discontinuity goes, right? If you have super and this is exaggerated of course right but if you have two surfaces like this that are locked together and there's a lot of roughness really rough you know maybe different grains interlocking with each other uh, these surfaces right trying to rip them apart trying to shear them apart it's going to be a lot more difficult than two completely smooth surfaces or even worse yeah two slick and sides right which slick and sides are going to be slick and sides that's a that's a fun word. I'll write that one out. Slick and sides are going to be products of faulting generally, and those are going to be extremely slicked surfaces that are going to be extremely prone to shear failure. Right? So slick and sides, bad. Roughness, good. Slick and sides are the opposite of roughness. If you do have slick and sided surfaces, then you're going to probably assign a zero on this roughness rating. So that's roughness again here we have lots of friction trying to fail that and shear is going to be pretty difficult here we have a lot more friction so that's it's going to be much more prone to shear failure the fourth piece we look at is infilling that's going to be the material that is inside of your discontinuity and generally speaking we can kind of break this into two categories the infilling itself we can have hard stuff this could be, you know, most types of mineralized infillings, you know, calcitic, uh, zeolites, maybe uh, serpentinization, these kinds of things. And then there's soft, which is going to be a big umbrella of all your different clay varieties, you know, kaolinite, etc. Soft clay gouges, you know, this kind of bad stuff. And out of the two of these, hopefully it's intuitive again that hard is going to be good it's going to be well i shouldn't say good it's going to be preferable to soft soft is going to be very bad again these softer minerals these clay like minerals remember what they actually are is very uh, sheet like right think of them as at the at the crystalline level at the uh, atomic level it's very sheet like crystal habit right that's going to be very conducive to sliding along the plane and usually that plane is going to be the same as the the plane of the discontinuity that shear plane so they're going to allow shear failure much more readily compared to to harder minerals of course harder minerals are still not preferable because they are an alteration from the original state of the rock and generally speaking they're going to remove those rough surfaces generally compared to the original rock 
surface. And so hard, I say good, but really it's more like, well, it's better than soft. Ideally, you have no infilling. If you want the most competent rock, ideally you have no infilling in there, but, you know, I'd rather have calcite in there than, than clay, so. And again, the, the thickness of the infilling here matters as well, and that's for the same reason as we talked about with aperture, right? You're generally going to want a less distance, right? So, uh, the, the cutoff I hear a lot is about five millimeters is where you have a pretty significant distinction, right? Five millimeters. If you have less than five millimeters of hard material, that's going to be pretty good. Anything greater, again, you're getting into that danger zone. Uh, as far as soft material goes, gr less than five millimeters, that's, you know, not great. But anything greater than five millimeters is where you start assigning a zero for this category. So the type of material and the amount that's in there, the thickness of the material, are going to be important for that infilling score. And then finally, the fifth category that we give here is weathering or alteration. And this one, again, I won't spend too much time on it because like roughness, most of it comes down to just experience, you know, making calls about what type of weathering has occurred, how weathered the surface is, that's a very kind of touchy, exactly what you might assign to it is going to be kind of difficult, you know, is it unweathered, completely unaltered, is it slightly weathered or stained, you know, and you can talk about, oh, can we scratch the surface with a knife, you know, if you can scratch it with your fingernail, you're getting into really kind of a dangerous territory, you know, the moderately weathered, highly weathered, the, the delineations that the system makes really are difficult to teach for a first time. It really does come down to experience. But the big thing, of course, again, with weathering is it's altering, weathering and alteration, I should say. It's altering the original state of the rock, which almost always reduces the sheer strength of the rock mass, makes the rock mass more prone to sheer failure. Uh, by removing kind of the natural resistance that that rock has. The surfaces are just going to be less capable of holding themselves together is kind of the key takeaway there. So again, all of these pieces are scored between 0 and 5. So if you went 0 and 6, excuse me, and there's 5 of them, so 0 through 6 by 5, of course, gets you a range for an overall score of 0 through 30. And again, that accounts for 30% of your overall rock mass rating, so this is not one to sleep on. Again, that's bigger than any other component, including the UCS, which is just a shame, because it would be so nice if the world were that simple, if we could just take a rock, take a core of rock, test it in the laboratory, and say, oh, yeah, the, the UCS is strong, so the rock mass is going to be strong, right? But it's just not that simple. So that's going to do it. We might do one more video on RMR and talk about the uh, discontinuity orientation and how that's going to affect the score. There's usually an adjustment that we make for that, but that's a little bit more of a, you might call it a bit of a new age kind of fancy thing. <laughs> that's a joke, of course. Now we'll get into it. It's important. It is an important thing, but yeah, that's going to do it for this one, so. Hopefully that was informative, otherwise good review, and I'll see you next time.